my name is Janine Amick. I am the executive director here at the Manatee Performing Arts Center. And we are very, very excited about the partnership that we have with the Library Foundation and moving forward to be able to diversify some of the programs we have offered for more than 70 years at the Manatee Players, Inc. But being able to bring in more community gathering opportunities, just like this evening with a lecture series. So it's my pleasure to introduce our guest author tonight. Lisa is the best-selling author of 13 novels and several short stories. Crazy Love You is her latest release. In the Blood, now in paperback, was a 2014 Goodreader's Choice Award nominee for Best Book, Amazon's Best Book of the Month, Suspense Magazine's Best Book of 2014, Sun Sentinel Best Mystery Novels of 2014, and an indie next pick. Additional accolades include selections as a finalist for International Thriller Writer's Best Novel Award, a winner of the Florida Book Awards, a finalist for Pre-Polar International Award, Bookspan's International Book of the Month, and a Target Emerging Author. Her books are published in 26 languages worldwide and have been named top picks by Today Show, Good Morning America, The Walmart Book Club, Harper's Bazaar, Family Circle, Good Housekeeping, Washington Life, Publishers Weekly, New York Daily News, Indie Next, and Amazon. She currently lives in Florida. It's hard to compare Miss Unger to any of her contemporaries. Unique, innovative, and often experimental, her writing is impossible to categorize. She combines her extensive knowledge of the human psyche with an understanding of trauma and feared to create novels that have earned her a reputation as one of the most skilled practitioners of the psychological thriller around today. Throughout her short 12-year career, she has walked the fine line between literary novels and commercial thrillers, all the while hitting the New York bestsellers list and earning both critical acclaims and millions of worldwide fans. Unlike many bestseller authors who stick with the formula to play it safe, Unger's bestseller status and loyal fan base have, if anything, propelled her to experiment more widely with her writing. Her character-driven novels explore the vast gamut of human experience, delving into the psychology of both protagonist and villain, often blurring the lines between the two. Please join with me and welcome Lisa Unger. Um, you guys got very well behaved. You were very chatty and drinking before, and now you're all just like sitting here. Okay, well, I'm going to talk. I'm going to just start, um, and I have a sort of informal style of speaking, so I'm going to talk for a little while about myself, and then I'm going to, and my books, obviously, and then I'm going to open it up to questions, and I know that some of you, Deandra, I don't see you. You've been specifically asked to think of a question. I know you're going to do that for me. Right. There you have <laughs> And then hopefully it'll be more just a chat than me standing up here talking about my favorite subject, myself. Um, I'm going to say just a couple words first about the Performing Arts Center and about the Library Foundation um, and also um, the independent bookseller, Elsie, who's here today. Thank you all for being here and thanks for um, organizing this event, Jane, and inviting me to be part of this wonderful community. My mom... Um, was a librarian, and you know she was the she was my first and earliest influence. I fell in love with books because of her love of story, and I spent many nights in the library doing my homework and reading while she was working. So I have a real fondness for libraries. Um, I was saying earlier this evening that libraries, like independent bookstores, and like um, venues like this, these places are the backbone of publishing and book selling in our communities. I think it's, it's really easy to live our lives online. We can be on Facebook and we can download eBooks and there's nothing wrong with that. And we can do, you know, we can be on Twitter, um, but these places, libraries, centers like this, and independent booksellers and booksellers in general, they want you to come out 
you know, so come out and be a part of these amazing things that are offered for the community. So many people are working hard to keep those things alive. So the one way you can support them is just by being there and enjoying what's out here in the community. So everybody here is supporting the libraries and the local bookseller and this place. So I would like you to give yourselves a round of applause. That was a little luxury, I know. But anyway, I'm going to move on. So um, I've been a writer all my life. I don't remember a time in my life before I defined myself that way. I you know, spent most of my time sort of journaling and writing poetry um, and you know, creating short stories and characters. And I, um, I, my family traveled a lot when I was a kid. And I think the first home I ever really found the first place I ever really belonged was in within the pages of a book. You know, it was perpetually kind of the new kid everywhere I went. But, you know, within the pages of a book, I could just sort of enter a whole new world and be um, at home. And I think that that is um, probably where, I mean, of course, where all writers find their first love is in the pages of another person's books. And maybe for writers, there's a moment, like maybe for some people, it's, it's you're, you know, you're content to just be a reader. But for the writer, the natural writer, there's a moment, a palpable moment, where you think to yourself, well, if I can be so moved by what somebody else is doing, maybe I can move somebody else with my words. Maybe I can create a story like this, or I can create a world and characters and, um, and give that to other people. And, and that was certainly sort of true for me. Um, and, you know, I, um, my mom was a librarian, but my dad was an engineer. And he thought my writing habit was, you know, kind of cute. You know, it's like a very good hobby that one might have to sort of, you know, fill all those empty hours that people have. These days they don't have any empty hours, but anyway. But it wasn't actually, like, a job. You know, it wasn't a career. It wasn't something that you could embark on. And he made sure that I was really clear on that. Um, you know, if you, like, if you cracked my dad's head open, like, graphs and pie charts would fly out. So, and I, I, I sort of remain the equation that he can't quite solve. But um, he, you know, he basically said, OK, look, you know, I know you've got this thing that you do, and that's great. Um, you're going to go to college, and um, I've got you covered. You know, I've got you covered through four years. I'm going to pay for your education. And frankly, you can take basket weaving for all I care. And he pretty much thinks I took basket weaving. Um, but when you graduate, you know, please don't move home to write your first novel. <laughs> You know, do not by any means sort of travel around Europe to find yourself, you know, get to work, you know, and buy a, get a job. And by a job, I mean, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to pay well, but it should at least pay every two weeks. So, you know, I kind of, not surprisingly, even though my, you know, the full thrust of my education, I went to the New School for Social Research in New York City. and you know, the um, sort of like the opposite of like an engineering school, like a really, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, my entire focus there was writing and literature. So I studied, you know, poetry and journalism and playwriting and, um, you know, short story, and, you know, I taught poetry in the New York City public school system and had just, like, sort of this amazing, very writerly, readerly focused education. But, you know, sort of, and I actually began my first novel while I was there at 19. Um, but when I graduated from, you know, from college, not surprisingly, I didn't have the confidence to <laughs> sort of pursue, pursue this dream I had of being a writer. So... I kind of did the only thing that, um, you know, a writer can do. You know, I went into publishing. So it was, and it was kind of like the closest thing I could do to following my dream without actually committing myself to it. 
So I wound up going to work for a company that at that point was called Putnam Berkeley. Of course, now it's, you know, from that point it was Penguin Putnam, and now it's Random Penguin, and, you know, they're perpetually sort of merging and turning into these giant behemoth companies. Um, but I, um, I went to work for them as a, as a book publicist. So it was, you know, 20 something years old, living and working in New York City, and I was basically, you know, throwing parties and traveling with authors and, you know, um, placing authors in the media. And, you know, it was kind of unfortunate for me that I happened to be extremely good at that job. So that job just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the time I spent writing got smaller and smaller and smaller until I wasn't really writing at all. I had this novel that I had begun when I was 19 years old, and it just kind of, you know, sat there, fallow, waiting. Um, and, and even so, I still sort of thought of myself as, as a writer. But then at a certain point, I was like about 27, I had kind of an epiphany. I realized that I was in the wrong job, that I was devoting 110% of myself to a job that I didn't really didn't really love. And um, I was with the wrong guy, not my husband. <laughs> like really the wrong guy. And um, I and I um, I had to sort of face the idea that, okay, five years, ten years down the road, you're gonna have to look back and say to yourself, you know what? You never even tried. And I felt like I could um, live with spectacular sort of crash and burn failure, but I wasn't going to be able to live with a slow fade to nothing, where I just let this, this thing that defined me for as long as I could remember just go away. So from that point, I did what every writer needs to do. What do you think that is? Right, yeah. So um, this is for all the aspiring writers out there. Um, a writer doesn't think about writing. A writer doesn't talk about writing or make excuses for why she didn't write that day. All you have to do to be a writer is put your pen to paper, your fingers to your keyboard, and write. That's it. And until you've done that, nothing else comes. So I had to kind of face that. And I had one point had a, a writing professor, and she gave some advice that I thought was a little bit harsh, but it has the kernel of truth to it. So listen up, aspiring writers who are not writing. She said, if you don't have, um, if you're not creative enough to find the time to write, then you're not creative enough to write. And that's harsh, right? It hurt, but it was true. <laughs> so I finally got creative enough to find the time that I need to write. Now, that said, I'm 27 years old, single, don't have any kids, whatever. It's, you know, it's a whole different ballgame when, that, when that's the case. But still, I spent, you know, I would get up early or stay up late, and I would, um, you know, stay in on the weekends. And even if it meant, like, sitting at my desk at lunch or, you know, sneaking, sneaking in a few lines in a meeting where I was actually supposed to be, atten you know, paying attention, publicizing other people's books, you know, I was writing. I knew what I had to do. I had my moment, and I was going to do it. So I finished my first novel, and even having done that, you know, I just felt gratified that I had actually written the book because, you know, a lot of people think that they, you know, they have a book in them, and I think most people think that, you know, but to add the actual journey from, you know, that first sentence to completed novel, that takes tremendous amount of will and dedication. So if anybody has actually done that, you've actually written your first novel and it's like sitting in a drawer somewhere and you're like, don't know what to do, you know, congratulate yourself because that's a big deal. Some people don't even get that far. Um, so I had this book and I was working in publishing and I was realized that I was a closet writer but I was a secret writer, like maybe everybody in publishing, right? You know, like, it's a, sort of like being a waitress and really an actress in L.A. You know, it's like you're not going to be at the, um, the dinner table with Tom Clancy and go, <laughs> by the way, Tom, I'm a, I'm a writer too. You know, there's just, 
there's just no place for that, you know? And um, so I kind of, I just kind of shelved it. You know, I was happy that I had gotten to that place. And I thought, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna see what happens. Um, so right around that time, a friend of mine moved from uh, New York City to Key West. And I went down to visit her. And while I was at Sloppy Joe's, yeah, we've all been there. Um, um, I met my husband, Jeff. There he is. I know what you're thinking. The relationships that begin at Sloppy Joe's are usually a little more short term. But this November, we're celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, almost. Um, and we, um, you know, it was really like a very big moment. It was a Shazam moment, like a love at first sight. And within three months, he had proposed. Within six, we had both sold our homes and quit our big corporate jobs. And we decided we were going wherever he got the best job. And I was going to take the money I made from selling my apartment and give myself one year to sell my book and write another one. My dad <laughs> was not too happy. And I'm so glad I have this big mic because I'm going to use it right now. He said, this is an uncalculated risk. It was. It was an uncalculated risk, and I was, you know, I was a little bit scared. Um, you know, I, I had no thought that I would sell that first novel. Like, there just didn't, it didn't even seem possible. And I just, I knew I could write another one and be better than I was the first time I wrote one. And, uh, but I still, you know, we kind of did this big, like, going for broke thing. I mean, I left New York City, all my friends, my family my job that I had been doing for, you know, almost 10 years. And we, you know, we came to Florida to Clearwater, where we're st we still are 15 years later. And, you know, I, that was it. I was a writer. I had sent my manuscript to agents. I was, you know, trying to write another book. And I, it was just one of those really heady times where it wasn't even so much a matter of what am I going to do? If I can't do this, it was more like, what am I if I'm not this? And so that was kind of scary. I didn't tell my dad how scary it was. <laughs> so, and my mom, you know, of course, she she knew it. She knew I was a writer early on. She, she always knew. Um, and, you know, so largely, you know, it was her sort of support and, you know, and my dad. and. My poor dad, I mean, what a good guy. He's, you know, he's so, he is actually amazingly supportive now. <laughs> In fact, he always try. you know, my parents have traveled with us all over the country so that, you know, we could bring my daughter everywhere. And so they're very like on deck. And like, if he was here, he'd just kind of be sitting there nodding and he'd have a whole list of his own questions waiting for the, for the end. So. I really am so mean to my dad, like, all the time, but I appreciate him. And to be honest, you know, his advice, you basically get a job, um, that's not bad advice, you know, <laughs> because most people are, are not going to publish. And most people, even if they do publish, aren't going to publish again. And um, even if you do get published and keep getting published, um, it's still a job. You still, you know, you work your butt, your butt off <laughs> like you do at anything else. So that work ethic um, is something that really served me. And my years in publishing also really served me um, later. Not That didn't serve me getting published. The, the, the company that I worked for for eight years rejected my manuscript. But that's, that's another talk. Anyway, so... You know, I had sort of, you know, I sent my book, and we moved to Florida, and I just kind of, you know, thought, well, here we go. So I was working on the second novel, and I, my phone rang one morning, and I saw the name 
of like my top to choice agent on my caller ID. And I just remember that moment, like really that moment, like, wow. Because no one calls unless they want to represent you. No one returns your calls, you know, or answers your letters or your email or whatever it is. So when I picked up the phone and she was there, I was like, you know, it was kind of this surreal moment. Um, and she went ahead uh, from that point, she signed me on. And one of the questions I asked her when, um, when she decided to represent me was, if you don't sell my first book, which I was pretty sure she wasn't gonna do, um, if you don't sell my first book, are you still my agent? And she said, yes. She said, I'm your, I'm your agent. I'm not the agent for this book. I said, okay, great. So we, um, we moved forward and she, she wound up selling my first book, the one I had written and the one I was writing in a two book deal to St. Martin's Press. And when I say a two book deal to St. Martin's Press, I mean like a very, very small, like nickel and a cheese sandwich. Um, don't quit your day, your day job, even though you already did, advance. And I couldn't have cared less. You know, I told her on the phone, I, I would have done it for nothing. She said, don't ever say that again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I went on to write, you know, two books for St. Martin's, and then I wrote a third novel for, um, for them. Uh, and this was my first series. It was featured a true crime writer by the name of Lydia Strong. They were mysteries. They were kind of, you know, sort of small mysteries. and. Um, I loved every minute of it. I mean, it was a total dream come true. I mean, I, having never wanted anything else for my life, there was like no end, you know, to my gratitude and excitement every day to work on my, you know, contracted novel that would then eventually be in stores. Like, that's the big time. And I, um, you know, I went to work on those three books and then in between the third and the fourth book, in my contract, I wrote another book. This was before I had a kid, when I could actually write another book in between my two contracted books. So I wrote another book, and it kind of sprang from, um, well, uh, and this is a good place to sort of talk about um, how ideas come, how, how those germs sort of form. I received a piece of um, mail, a junk mail, and it was, you know, we've all seen them. They're like those blue and white flyers. And on one side, there's an ad. And on the other side, there's a picture of like a, an age graduated picture of um, somebody who's been missing. And I looked at this thing. It was like, you know, a girl that had been missing for many years. And they had, you know, they had um, altered the photograph. And I thought, what if I, um, what if I looked at this and recognized myself? And that led me to doing a bunch of research, which is usually what happens once I get some kind of a little zap, like some kind of like, boom, I can think about this some more. Um, and if something, the best way I can explain it then is if something can, if it connects with something larger that's going on inside me, I start hearing a voice. And I started hearing the voice of Ridley Jones, and she told me the story that became Beautiful Eyes. Um, and, you know, I wrote this book, and of course my parents think that, you know, um, it's my, basically my 400-page meditation on how I might not really be their child. <laughs> but of course that's not true. Um, and I wrote this book, and I was excited about it. You know, I had, the, the contract was for another book within the series that I had already written, but my agent loved it, and she's like, well, you know, let's give it to them, and so I did, and your publisher has um, what's called right of first refusal, which means they have the first chance to say, no, we don't want this, <laughs> and they, they exercise their right of first refusal on that manuscript. They said, my editor said, you know, it's got some problems, and really like your series, and we just want you to, you know, keep doing that. And I thought, 
well, yeah, I want to keep doing that, but I want, I wrote this book. I mean, it came from this very, you know, pure place. It was like one of those books that sort of had to be written. Like there was no way not to write it. And, you know, um, my agent said, well, um, it's okay. She's like, just write the next book and we're going to take this someplace else. So I did. I went on to write my the fourth book in, in that series, which was Angel Fire, The Darkness Gathers, Twice, and Smoke. Smoke was the fourth book in that series. And um, but Beautiful Eyes, my my agent was able to sell it to Random House. And it went on to be my first New York Times bestseller and you know, to be published in 26 languages and you know, still sells very briskly today. Um, almost 10 years later. Um, so the interesting thing about that is that, you know, that day when your publisher tells you that they don't want your book, um, that's a bad day. That's a really bad day. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you sort of keep writing and that's kind of, you know, the trick to all of it is just like my my favorite phrase is nose to the keyboard. You know, you can't control what goes on out there. You can only control what goes on right there. So that's where I sort of kept my head and it wound up being the best thing for that book because maybe if it had been published there, it wouldn't have gotten the attention that it did when it first came out. So that's kind of um, a little bit of, you know, how the how the journey, how the journey works. But, you know, so from Beautiful Eyes, I went on to write a number more books. I just turned in my 14th novel um, this past week. And um, I, uh, I just published earlier this year my 13th novel um, called Crazy Love You. Um, and, you know, I'm going to stop here. I could continue on for a long time but I'm going to open <laughs> longer than you can imagine. Um, but I'm going to open it up to questions, and I know you have them, and you're not going to be shy. So let's hear it. Let's have it hit me. Hi. In the blue? Yeah. <laughs> How have you managed to fit in continuing to be a writer? I, I gave up sleeping. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting question. I, you know, I was right around the time where, when Beautiful Eyes got, um, uh, was published, uh, or when it was first purchased and I knew it was going to be published, I got pregnant. And um, we, you know, we'd been sort of, we'd been working on it. <laughs> it wasn't like a surprise or anything, but it was, the timing was a little bit like, oh, interesting. And, um, and, you know, and Ocean, my daughter Ocean, was born four months before Beautiful Eyes published. And, you know, there was a 14 city, uh, 12 city, 14 day book tour in my future. So I said, that's fine. We're all going. I'm not leaving the baby. That doesn't work. So we're just all going to go. My parents are like, we'll go. And I was like, great. So it's going to be my husband, my parents, my four-month-old nursing infant, and off we go to do the book tour. And I had a really nice publicist at the time, and she's like, she had three children. And she was like, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, no. I mean, what's the big deal? I'm not leaving my kid, and I'm not giving up the book tour, so we're just going to do it. And she's like, okay. I go, and I'm going to blog about it. She's like, sure you are. <laughs> so I wound up doing it. I mean, we did it, all of us. And, you know, I always laugh about, I always said about Ocean in her first year that she'd been, you know, she'd been breastfed in more than 100 um, bookstore parking lots across the country. <laughs> and so it was like this really, you know, big mess. You know, my daughter, my husband, my parents, you know, my dad had to take care of my mom so my mom could take care of the baby so Jeff could take care of me. And it was completely mad. It was just total madness. But I, And I don't know how we did it, but I would not have traded a single second of it. And so, you know, it kind of, 
you know, it was a, a, it was a process to find the balance. I mean, prior to Ocean being born, nothing had ever um, rivaled my desire to write. There had been nothing I had ever wanted to do more than that. And then she kind of burst on the scene and she just became the, you know, just basically the center of my spirit. And so whenever I was trying to work, I, you know, was wishing I was with her. And when I was with her, I was worried about work. And so it's not surprising that the book I wrote at that time, you know, called Blackout is about this woman with very, like, you know, serious dissociative issues, you know, like <laughs> a deeply fractured, troubled character. Um, but, you know, as, you know, and I just sort of wound up, you know, working around her schedule at a certain point when, when Jeff could come and work for the business, as we like to call it, he did. And then he was there for support. And then I just, you know, as her schedule has expanded, so has mine. But I've always worked around her schedule. And like for a long time, she didn't even know that I had a job. And then a couple of years into it, she was like, when I grow up, I want to be a mommy writer just like you. I was like, we'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk about all that. And, um, you know, and so she, she's been all over the world with me. I mean, she's been, you know, everywhere from, you know, the London Book Fair to, you know, uh, the Australian book festivals. And, you know, just she had a passport when she was four months old. And she's just, you know, she's just been along for the ride, for everything. And now, you know, she's a writer. She, she is an, she's a superstar reader, and she's an amazing writer. She's writing her own comic book right now, which is, you know, tremendously cool. And it's just been, like, this kind of evolving creative project, you know, parenting, writing, mommy writer. I actually blog about it now. I didn't blog about it on that tour, but... I do write about it now, like sort of the conflict, you know, when you have this thing, these two hugely consuming creative enterprises and how, you know, that kind of works and how for all working moms, you know, it's such a it's such a balancing act. You know, you're trying always to, you know, be the best you can be as a mom, be the best you can be as a writer. And I think most moms who are working feel that way, too. Oh, uh, OK, I can't. I can. Hold okay, now. hold on, and sorry. I'm sorry, She's Kelly, I just walked right. away. And there's a lady back there who's waiting for yes, her question, too. To uh, my question has to do with your writing process. Yes. Uh, I've listened to and, and heard, read about authors lately who say they start with an idea and, and a character and see where their character goes. Mm -hmm. Do you start out with a carefully plotted out uh, plan for it and then fill it in? Or do you start out with the idea and see where it goes? Yeah, I, I, d I never have an outline. I have no idea what my book is even about when I start writing it. I don't know how it ends. I don't know who's going to show up or what's going to happen day to day. Every novel is an act of faith for me. Um, it usually starts, like I was mentioning with Beautiful Eyes, it usually starts with, and I'll use In the Blood as another example, um, with a, you know, like a moment, a zap, and it could be anything, a piece of junk mail, a line of poetry, a song, and it gives me some kind of a weird feeling that I can't really explain. It's like a, just a little buzz of excitement, like, ooh, that's really weird or scary or gross or whatever. And um, I start um, researching. So I'm just going to start reading like, anything that interests me. So in the case of In the Blood, for example, I read um, an article in the New York Times Magazine about, um, written by a, a psychiatrist who claimed that he could diagnose um, the early signs of um, the psychopath in children as young as the age of five. And I thought, wow, you know, that seems wrong, but okay. So I started doing this research into, you know, sort of childhood psychopathy. And, you know, this doctor has, you know, he believed that, um, well, you know, everybody knows that the, one of the main lacking qualities in the psychopath is empathy. And he believes that the United States is breeding more psychopaths than any other country in the world. And basically because a lot of the values that we hold, like, you know, success at any cost and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, rugged individualism feeds psychosis in a way that other cultures that are more you know, knitted together and feel more interdependent as a culture, 
um, there those those people are mimicking um, you know they're mimicking the qualities that allow them to survive anyway he's created a school where he feels that um, he can intervene with these young psychopaths and um, teach them empathy if not teach them empathy teach them to mimic empathy does that sound like it would work it's not working right it's it's definitely not working according to this was my takeaway from the article anyway it's not working these kids are you know together they're manipulating each other they're preying on one one another i mean the article just it basically just blew my mind so then i started you know doing all this research and while um i was doing this research i started hearing the voice of my main character lana granger and the only thing I knew about her when I started writing that book was that she was a liar, that everything she said was pretty much a lie, and that she was deeply veiled, that she had, um, that I sensed her as being somebody who was in a sort of a cocoon, and that when she emerged from that cocoon, she was going to be somebody different altogether. And that's all I knew when I started writing. And I don't know how it works. <laughs> I don't, and you'll find too with authors that, you know, it falls into two very distinct camps. There are the people who very successfully, you know, outline every single chapter. You know exactly what's going to happen. There's character sketches. You know, everything is, you know, 90% of the process is in that outline. Um, but for me, you know, I write for the same reason that I read because I want to know what's going to happen to these people living in my head. And that's, I, I can't explain it any better than that. Hi. Um, like Mr. Clement, who just asked you that question, I'm a professional writer, and mm. he was for decades the opinion writer for the Bradenton Herald. Right. And I, I was blessed with succeeding him. But I, I, I'm curious, too, about the writing process yeah. and how you go about starting and writing and how many dead ends do you hit and uh when do you just start throwing away stuff uh you know you go this is not working uh i this the storyline is not going anywhere do you do you ever hit that kind of dead end or uh do you just kind of <laughs> change directions change directions I, you know writers always do that right of course of course i i actually you know i don't have as many dead ends as you would think in the way that i write i mean i'm you know my process is you know i have this voice and when i sit down to write i'm actually i'm not actually hearing a voice like i'm not like you know, I'm not a schizophrenic. I know the difference most of the time between the people outside my head and inside my head, like 90% of the time, you know. Um, but I actually, I'm either seeing something, like a scene that plays out over and over again, or I'm hearing something, I'm hearing a sentence, or, you know, I, I just have a general sense of what my story is going to be, and I literally just sit down and start writing from, from that place. And I have no idea, uh, I have no idea who's going to show up and what they're going to do day to day, literally. Um, that being said, you know, in the process, you know, my, you know, sort of my golden creative hours are from 5 a.m. to noon. You know, those are my hours. I don't always get them because Ocean, my daughter, her golden creative hours are also apparently 5 a.m. to noon. <laughs> So, you know, and she always, you know, she's the trump card, like, you know, it's like when she wants mom, like everything else kind of goes out the window. But I, you know, and those hours are where I am the most um, connected to whatever part of my brain it is that's telling the stories the way I tell them. And a lot of times I will go back to what I have written and I don't remember writing it. And that's pretty weird, but that's just my that's just my thing. That's just my process. So you know, for me, you know, I'm going to be writing, 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 and then there's going to be a stop. You know, it's just going to hit a wall, and I'm just going to sit there. You know, for however long, and then if nothing happens, then I'm going to get up and I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to, you know, put, you know, my headphones on. I'm going to blast music into my head. I'm going to work out as hard as I can work out until something shakes loose. <laughs> and then I'll start hearing the next thing. 
And that's how I work my way through. And I actually, I have not had the experience where I feel like I've hit a dead end, the story's not working. I have moments where I'm like, wow, this book completely sucks. And the worst thing about it is that I suck so much that I can't make it better. And it's like a very angsty, like temper tantrum type situation that I have. And then I go to the gym and I come back and I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I need to do. And then I move forward. So it's like, for me, you know, the process has an ebb and a flow and over like any organic process. So over time, I have learned to be more comfortable in the ebb, knowing that that's where it all is you know, in the blank spaces, in the quiet spaces, which, you know, P.S., everybody's after those blank spaces. You know, it's like you're in front of your computer and it's like Twitter, Facebook, email, you know, whatever. Like everybody's after those blank spaces. As a writer, that's the time that you need to protect more, you know, more passionately than you protect anything else in your life because that's where all the narrative problems find their solution. So that's why exercising, why, you know, just putting, even if I just have to put an eye mask on so I can't like look at my computer, go like lie down somewhere and like not look at a computer that's gonna distract me or want something from me or, you know, give me, an, <laughs> give me a dopamine rush from like an email ping or whatever, like all the things that we use to distract ourselves. So um, that's kind of the way, that's kind of the way it works for me. And I haven't run, I, I honestly, in my in in 14 novels and and three short stories and countless other stuff i've never come to a place in my novel where i think i've hit a dead end the story doesn't work i know the story's there i just have to find it so that's my responsibility as a writer to find out why i came to this place and how i go forward who was in the back there was somebody in the back Oh, <laughs> well, I feel like that ship may have sailed, you know, like the second baby thing. Like, we have a Labradoodle. I don't know. Like, we, we, think, we think of him as our, yeah. <laughs> I think Ocean would have been a great big sister, but, you know, it sort of wasn't in the cards. But, you know, she's a really good big sister to Jack-Jack. To Actually, she's not. You know, she tortures him, and he tortures her. So I don't know. I don't know how it would have worked out. But, you know, we, it's funny to um, be working and have her next to me working on her own thing. And she's nine. And, you know, we talk about her stories. And, you know, we actually just went to her big, her celebration of learning where she wrote a book and illustrated it and bound it. And you know what? It's like a totally scary, dark mystery. <laughs> like, like all of her friends are writing about like, you know, bunnies and flowers and oceans got like this character that's having nightmares and there's a man in her nightmare that comes into the, into the real world. It's like really not so far from the stuff that I write. And I'm like, wow, you know, sorry kid, you know, like, and she's got the same totally dark imagination, and we talk about things that, like, no parent and nine-year-old should be talking about. Like, we, she just asks these questions, and we talk about all this dark stuff. But, you know, that's just who she is, you know? And I, and I remember it for myself, too. And I, when I was her age, like, I've always had this really dark and twisted imagination, you know? I have just always been able to, like, spin out the most horrible scenario of any situation that I find myself in. And, you know, that's great for fiction. It's not so great for life. But, you know, I, I've always just had this, like, this really, like, ferocious curiosity about human nature and the psyche and all those, those dark places. And, you know, I've always, I sort of think of myself as a spelunker. You know, I'm kind of, like, shimmying into these dark places of the human heart and the human mind and, in the imagination and you know I kind of always think of myself as like you know when you're at the movies and there's a sound in the basement and the girl is going down the stairs and everybody in the movie theater is like don't go into the basement I'm the girl going into the basement that's me and now unfortunately I've got my daughter by my hand too so she's coming in too we're going into the basement uh, thank you given this very interesting process where your character, your thought, 
uh, is leading you or you're not sure where it's going, how do you know how to bring it to an end? Does she bring it to an end, a character, or at some point do you need to draw the curtain down? Well, I mean, it can go a couple of different ways. Like, the, you know, the instinct of the writer is just to keep writing. You know what I mean? You always keep on to go explain more, tell more, you know, make sure, did everybody get that? You know, like, whatever, just to keep writing. But I feel like, you know, for me, as, um, as an avid reader all my life, I mean, a ridiculously avid reader, like, as a kid and as an adult, I mean, I have read wildly across genre. Like, there's literally nothing I won't read. And I, I feel like I've always been that way. And in some way, between that and my education and the writing that I do, that the sort of the form of the novel, and this makes my dad very happy. Like, you can imagine how uncomfortable my dad is with the idea that I don't know how my story's going to end, right? Like, he cannot get that. So I think that in some sense, the form of the novel, the arc, which he loves, he loves to hear about the arc. That makes him so happy. Um, the the arc, I think, in some ways is, like, sort of internalized in me. Like, I can feel the peak of the book, and I can I, and I can feel how it's coming together. And the ending is just sort of, sometimes it's just there, and sometimes you've overwritten it, and you wind up cutting back and thinking, oh, the ending was 15 pages earlier. I didn't need to explain every, you know, thing, or the information at the end needed to be woven in earlier or whatever. But, you know, you kind of you kind of just know when, when the story's end. The only story I knew when it ended and I actually stopped myself from writing another word was in the blood. When I wrote the last two words of that book, I knew that writing anything else would be the biggest mistake I ever made. So I, um, I actually honored that sort of ending. Hi, uh, I was wondering uh, in the introduction you received tonight, uh, it was mentioned that you had a good understanding of trauma. Mm. And I had just uh, recently finished Beautiful Lies, mm. and that really resonated because while I was reading, I thought, wow, this is, you know, very, one can rel relate well to it. Where do you attribute that to coming from? Well, I mean, I don't have any trauma in my own life. Like, I, you know, my family, you know, as, as much as, as viciously as I complain about them and give my parents the hardest possible time of any grown child, I, you know, I kind of, I, I live in the light. You know, I've never, I don't even, you know, I only have the most sort of banal, boring dysfunction in my family. There are no secrets, I mean, that I know of. I mean, maybe there are. Maybe there are tons of secrets that, I still haven't figured out, but I, um, you know, I sort of, I, I, you know, it goes back to sort of my imagination, my, you know, desire to kind of look at the dark side, and I just do a tremendous amount of research. You know, I talk to doctors, I read constantly, and there was a there was a book um, by a, a a a doctor, Dr. Kalshed, and he wrote a book called the um, the Secret Life of Trauma. And it was about how, uh, how the psyche metabolizes trauma. And one of the things that he said in that, in that book, which I had never heard anybody else talk about, was he said that, you know, the splitting, he talked about mental illness, like severe mental illness as a result of trauma, in early childhood trauma, almost as a gift, because the psyche splits itself in order to survive. And I found that really fascinating. The book was tremendously fascinating about how the human mind deals with extraordinary situations of trauma. I mean, it's a disturbing book, but I think that, um, you know, it's that type of reading and the type of research that I do that, and just, you know, people talk to me and I have, a, you know, I, I have, I'm very empathetic to my characters, you know, and empathetic to the people that I meet. And I think that writers, you know, maybe you're first and foremost a reader, but even beyond that, all writers are observers. And if you're truly an observer and you're truly somebody who listens and has empathy for people and for your characters, I think that almost any condition is understandable. Um, Mer Meryl Streep was interviewed um, about the Iron Lady, and um, the interviewer asked her how she could so inhabit 
um, that person, how she could so inhabit her characters. And she said something that I have never forgotten. She said that she believed that within every person is the germ of every other person. And that if you are truly open to that idea, that you can access almost anybody's life. And, and that's, how I, that's how I feel about my characters. Can you talk a little bit about the editing of books? Do you edit your own books, or does your family get to read them and edit them, or how do you? How, what is the editing process? It's a long process. So I I turn my book in um, to you know there, I have a couple of people who read while I write. My husband reads while I write. Um, my my editor, who's like been my at. At, now she's at Simon Schuster, but she's my long she's my longtime editor. I'm with Simon and Schuster now as well. Um, she reads while I write, and it's not that I actually want any editorial direction. It's that I just want to hear whatever question she has. Like we generally have like a sort of a vague talk a couple times, and I need her to have read something so that when I call her up and go, I need to talk, and she'll go, What about? And I'll say. I don't know. <laughs> and she go, okay, just start talking. And so I start talking, and then somehow, but that's the relationship I have with her. Somehow she intuits what I need to discuss, and we discuss it, and it helps me get through some of those, you know, those ebb spaces. So I have somebody to talk to. So then I usually finish, you know, I finish a first draft. I'm going to set it aside um, for a week or however long I actually have to set it aside. And then I'm going to go back to it from page one, and I'm going to start reading, and I'm going to rewrite in that first draft. And when I feel like it's gotten to be the best book that I can make it, I turn it into my editor. And so what happens then is she reads it, and then she and I will have a really long editorial conversation. She'll be like, I didn't. I didn't understand this. I wanted more of this. This didn't work for me. What about this? Did you think about that? And so we have this really long conversation. And sometimes it could be like an hour, take a break, call back. It could go over two days. It depends on how much stuff there is to actually talk about. So then I take all of her suggestions, and I start again from page one. And I read and rewrite throughout the book. I, I, I try to feel. Um, her her comments like even if I disagree with something I try to figure out what made her feel that way like maybe there's another issue underneath that I, I'm not getting or whatever um, but like you know the, the process now that I'm older and I've been writing for longer like I think I can really feel when a change is great because I'm open to it I'm open to editorial suggestion so when I feel like something that she has said or a change that she wants is great I'm like awesome, this is great, it's going to make it much better. But I also have moments where I'm, I feel, you know what, it's not going to work. This is changing my story. It's not what I wanted to say. But what was it that stopped her here? What was the problem? So that's usually the, the first round. Then there's going to be a smaller round of editorial. And then there's going to be line editing, where we go through the book line by line. And, um, you know, Maybe there's, you know, we talk about words, we talk about sentences, or what did you mean here? I, this didn't work, you know, we need a better transition. Then, you know, then that's pretty much it, you know, um, for that round. Then it goes to copy editing. That is hard. <laughs> so there are people, copy editors, you know all about them, don't you? Yeah, um, so, and, th and let's not slag on copy editors because thank God for copy editors really these people save you they do they save you from making the worst mistakes and but then there's also a lot of like okay um in this sentence you use the word squashed did you really mean quashed and you think god did i did i really <laughs> did i really mean and it's agonizing i mean it's like it's like i'm sorry but there's no flight from new york to santa fe on this airline at this time really? Are you sure about that? I'm pretty sure I flew on that airline. No, you didn't. So, so there's that process. And then, so we go, you know, we go through all, go through all of that. And, um, and then, you know, there's a first pass, which is like after the book has been typeset. And then 
I'm told that most authors don't ask for second pass, but I do. And then I ask for third pass. And then I ask for fourth pass. And my editor's like, look, she's like, you cannot make any changes now. You can only make any small corrections that you might happen to find at this point, which God help us if there's anything. You know, and I'm like, I'm so insulted. I can't believe you would think I would try to make changes in fourth pass. And then, like, at 3 a.m., I'm like, on page 69, you know, like, there's. <laughs> so, like, I mean, I'm at that thing and literally until they pry it out of my hands. And I would go back and rewrite everything even now. So that's me. That's my editorial process. It takes a year, not surprisingly. Hi. Um, you mentioned Facebook and Twitter. How has that changed your writing or, or has it or your <laughs> writing process? And do you have to uh, carve out time for that? Do you just let it come as it comes? Or? Yeah. Uh, social media. Wow. I mean, social media for writers is it's kind of like a double edged sword. Um, it's amazing to be able to connect with your readers in real time. I mean, there's something amazingly gratifying and nice about that. Um, you know, they, it, it is, it's not like, you know, there's some publishing rule that you must be active on social media, but it's strongly encouraged. Um, and it's a real, I mean, it's a real marketing tool. Um, I come from a marketing background, so I'm not as uncomfortable with it as other people are. That said, I'm not as fluent with it as other people are. Um, you know, I'm I'm a writer. I'm writing my novels. I don't want to live my life on Facebook. I want the stuff that comes to me to be held, you know, for my blank spaces to find its way onto the page. But, you know, and it can be a terrible, terrible distraction. Because especially for, you know, for me, the way I write, the way I live, you know, I work around my daughter's schedule. Those hours when she's in school, like, that's use them or lose them. And, you know, when she's home, I generally, like, I can write and I have done when I have, you know, when I have deadline or, you know, after she goes to sleep, I write again. But, you know, those are really important hours. So that blank space, the space where, you know, you've kind of reached your, you know, your creative you know, end for the day or the hour or whatever it is, it is so easy and so tempting to switch out, to go, oh, I'll check my email. Oh, I should go on Facebook. I have to. It's important. <laughs> Twitter, you know, whatever. And then, like, okay, there's the hour. And, and it's almost impossible to switch back to the creative space. Like, you need to find a, a, your way back. So, you have to, I mean, I have sort of, you know, I mean, it's kind of a new thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of a new thing for writers. It's a new challenge. Um, Stephen King always talks about, you know, writing with the door closed. And you can close the door, but you have to close the door on your computer, too. So I actually have, you know, I have apps that block the social networks. And it's called Antisocial. For all you writers out there, Learn it and love it, OK? So it lets you still get the stuff that you need to get. You can still research, but you can't go on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, Amazon, God forbid, you know, like all of it. So you know, sometimes you need, you, need to, um, you need to do that. You need to sort of, and then once you're sort of in the routine of like knowing, saying to yourself, you know, I'm only doing social media at this time of the day, at this time of the week. Once you get that set, you know, and you want that, then that's kind of how I, that's kind of how I do it now. I try not to be, you know, on it when I should be writing. It's a constant challenge. How do you differentiate your characters from book to book, and how do you develop them before you start? Um, okay, this is going to be another really weird answer. I don't think of my characters as people that I create. I think of my characters as people that I meet. So they come to me from all different areas of my psyche, my split, twisted <laughs> writer's psyche. And um, I, I don't, it's, it's not a matter, it, it's, you know, it's like I couldn't confuse you with the lady sitting next to you or the woman sitting in front of you or the one behind you because you're completely different. So there's no, you know, there's no um, thought about differentiating characters. Characters are, um, they can come from the same germ that story comes from. 
um, you know, there might be the, the germ for the story like I was talking about, and then um, the um, and then the book the book follows that. There also too might be a germ for character, um, but that germ could I could keep that for for a long time. Like I'll see someone or hear something or connect with someone or overhear a passage of conversation or you know um, have you know even a relationship. And, you know, something in that is going to stay. And the person that comes from that germ is not going to be based on the person who gave me the initial germ, um, although some people think that they, they are in my books, but they're not. <laughs> not really. I mean, for real, not really. But, um, you know, there might be that germ or that seed from, you know, again, the, you know, the constant observing so every character, like every every story, is sort of an amalgamation of you know my knowledge, my opinions, my imagination, and something else that I don't really have access to. So I don't know if that really totally answers your question. Last question, please. When you were your daughter's age, mm -hmm. did you have a favorite author like um, Judy Bloom? And your daughter has she read the Harry Potter series? Yeah, I mean, Ocean is like a crazed superstar reader. Her big thing right now is um, the Percy Jackson books. Like she's obsessed with Percy Jackson. Um, of course, the Harry Potter books as well. And then we have a lot of different things that that we've read together. Like you know, some of my favorites, like you know, the Island of the Blue Dolphins, and you know, like this kind of classic, you know, real children's literature. And then. Also, um, you know, we just read Wonder by R.J. Palaccio, which was amazing for both of us. So we have a whole, like, reading life together. And I was reading like, super inappropriate stuff when I was her age. Like, my parents were basically, they, they were avid readers, and there were just books everywhere. And the, the bottom line was if I could reach it and read it, it was mine. So I was reading things like Sidney Sheldon and Stephen King and like, I mean, no wonder, right? No wonder I'm so warped. But I, B.C. Andrews and, you know, Truman Capote was one of my first and earliest influences. Like that's where I fell in love with prose in the like short stories of Truman Capote. But it's also um, his book, uh, um, In Cold Blood, is, I, I credit it as one of my, um, one of the books that gave me permission to be who I am as a writer, you know, because I learned that you could write about, and obviously it's a, it's true crime, it's not fiction, but it reads like fiction. It's the first book of its kind. It's a true crime book that reads like fiction. And I realized that you could write about, you know, tremendous darkness and you could do it with, you know, great beauty and depth and empathy and, you know, understanding of your characters, even the most um, twisted among them. So that was one of my first, you know, important influences. And uh, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier was like my first thriller, you know, which is like, and, it, and it's actually a theme that runs through all of my work. I see it now from a distance, of course, is like the sort of ordinary girl thrust into these, you know, extraordinary circumstances and how does she, you know, navigate that and survive. And I would say that, you know, from that first influence to today, it's one of the things that, you know, one of the questions that fascinates me the most. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please don't uh, leave without getting one of the newest copies autographed by Miss Unger out in the gallery. And we would hope that you will come back and join us in, Jane, when is it? July? It is in July for the next of our three series this year. Thank you again for coming. Enjoy. <laughs>